Ladies and gentlemen, honorable speakers, thank you very much for being with us today. At this session, we are going to discuss about how Europe is on the right track in the creation of excellence in science and innovation. However, there is still work that needs to be done so as to transform world-class science to world-beating companies. So during our session, we'll discuss how the European Innovation Council can address this gap between research and deep tech-driven innovation at the pan-European level. My name is Alsa Papadopoulou. I'm a legal and policy officer at the European Innovation Council. And together with us, we have today a lineup of distinguished speakers. I have today with me Mr. Jean-Éric Paquet, Director General of DG Research and Innovation European Commission. I have Mr. Jean-David Malot, Director of the European Innovation Council, European Commission. Professor Mark Ferguson, who is the Chair of the EIC Advisory Board. Professor Kurt Melhorn, who is the member of the ERC Scientific Council. And Professor Maria Mosley-Rosen, who is the founder of SPARC at Stanford. Professor Tobias Kippenberg from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. And Mr. Filippo Bosco, who is the CEO and founder of the company BlueSense Diagnostics. We will have a questions and answers session. And now I shall pass the floor to our distinguished speakers. Mr. Paquet, the floor is yours. And I thank you very much. I'm delighted to be uh, opening this uh, session. Uh, because uh, this is about uh, the two beacons of uh, Europe's uh, science, research and innovation landscapes. I mean, Mark will no doubt say it in a moment, these are also a little bit our rebel institutions, uh, the European Research Council, always pushing the boundaries of science and uh, uh, ensuring that science is done in the most impactful, groundbreaking, disruptive way. And then the very same goes for the European Innovation Council, which is really pushing here also Europe and our way of working uh, to new boundaries to uh, ensure that it can support the innovators which are also in Europe. It's a great session to bring them together. I mean, so much binds you. This will be explored during the session, so I'm not going to cover it. Just let me give you a couple of, uh, of elements on my side. The first one is that um, uh, the European Research Council, like the European Innovation Council, are, are outstanding institutions. Uh, the ERC is Europe's uh, Nobel Prize factory. Uh, Professor, I hope you will not mind that, um, that, 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 that description. Uh, and there are already many nobles which are funded by the ERC and um, there will be Nobel Prize winners. There are Nobel Prize winners which are where the research has led to the Nobel Prize. And that I think is very natural because it's the most groundbreaking science which is uh, supported uh, by uh, the European Research Council. Mark, you know that for me, the European Innovation Council is Europe's unicorn factory. Uh, we are not quite there yet, but that's normal. You are less than a year old and it takes a bit of time to scale up, including not just in Europe. Um, I would even say maybe Europe's green unicorn factory after having been in a session with Youssef Youssef, Youssef one of your, uh, your members of the advisory board who, uh, who showed us how much the green deal call in the EIC has uh, been able to pick up amazing technologies. The marriage between the European Research Council and the European Innovation Council is completely natural because it puts together what Europe is strong at, the best science on the one hand, and then turning that science and our, I think, uh, unique engineering culture into deep tech innovation. This is what the European Innovation Council is all about. You had a flying start, you will describe it, Mark and Jean-David, so I don't do it, just to say that I am uh, really impressed by how impactfully you kicked off in the last year. So ERC and EIC, uh, the pronunciation when you're not an anglophone like me sometimes sounds pretty similar, this was not on purpose, uh, are two amazing institutions, both inspired a little bit by our American friends, the NSF on the one hand and DARPA on the other. I would add, yes, it's a bit the NSF, a bit DARPA, just a bit better. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Paquet for this intervention. And as we now, we will move on to our next speaker. We are going to see how the interface between the EIC and the ERC can happen, what has already happened, and what can be next. The floor is yours, Professor Ferguson. 
So thank you very much. And let me just echo what uh, Jean-Éric has said. There is great complementarity between the European Research Council and the Uni European Innovation Council. Essentially, we want to take the really disruptive, groundbreaking research that the European Research Council funds, and some of that will have the potential to grow into really innovative companies. So we are already in uh, advanced discussions and implementation with the European Research Council about setting up a transition fund, something where the European Research Council, particularly their proof of concept uh, awardees, can transition into European Innovation Council funding and grow and scale the companies uh, from those deep technologies. And this is really important. It's really important to connect up the pieces of the European research and innovation ecosystem, the ERC, the EIT, uh, the member states' activities on the one hand uh, at, at the formation stream and also further upstream uh, the European investment funds. So full support, full complementarity and a great working relationship between uh, the EIC and the ERC uh, and I thank my colleagues in the ERC very much uh, for their collaboration. Just a few words about the European Innovation Council. We hope to be for innovation what the European Research Council is for research, namely a beacon for international excellence, the investor of choice for entrepreneurs within Europe. We want to crowd in private investment. We want the companies to grow and scale. We want to be able to provide funding and mentoring and links into corporates, links into networks with uh, venture capital. And we also want to address the untapped potential in Europe on female founders in the uh, widening countries of the European uh, Union. There's a lot of real potential there and you can see it in the applications to the EIC where there are many of them that get funded and a whole lot more that are in the good but not quite at the funding bar level. And by providing the mentoring services that may not necessarily be present in those member states and also by providing the encouragement to female founders, we really want to uh, increase that, to increase the diversity. And I would emphasize that this is not just a socially good thing to do, it's actually a very good business uh, decision because it's very clear that companies that have more diverse boards are actually more profitable. So that's the ambition of the European Innovation Council. We've been in pilot mode and I'll be able to say a few things later on about that. But to close, uh, I want to emphasize our close working relationship with the European Research Council. Wouldn't it be absolutely terrific if we took Nobel Prize winning science and translated it into billion dollar companies in Europe? And wouldn't it be even more terrific if those companies were addressing socially important issues like climate action, like the responsible use of artificial intelligence, and so on. So, over to uh, Kurt to say a few words about the European Research Council. Thank you, Professor Ferguson. And indeed, now we shall hear the perspective of the ERC for Professor Melhorn. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks. Uh, the ERC stands for basic research. In fact, as Joy Eric remarked, world-class basic research, he called us the Nobel Prize factory. Our projects create new insights at the frontier of knowledge. And our projects trains lo train lots of young scientists, more than 30,000 so far. Innovation is almost always based on new insight. Insight must precede innovation, is a prerequisite for innovation, but insights by no means automatically turn into innovation. The road from insights to innovation is windy, bumpy, there are dead ends, and uh, we are very glad that we can partner up with the EIC on this road. The EIC has the expertise, has the people, has the funding, to turn insights into innovation. We as the ERC do not have this expertise and also not the funding. So it's very natural that the EIC and the ERC teams up. What does this mean concretely? We established a committee consisting of people from both boards. We have met twice so far. And uh, I would say the atmosphere in these meetings that we had so far was, was very constructive. Both sides are convinced that together we are stronger than each one of us alone. Are there already concrete outcomes? Yes. Uh, 
One is the meeting today, the research and innovation days. Second, the EC, EIC is putting up this new funding line, transition funds. Uh, the EIC has a, the ERC has a small funding line called proof of concepts where we allow some of our projects to make the first steps toward innovation, but these are very small funds and a very small part of our budget goes in there. We have always hoped that there could be something like what we call the super POC and uh, the transition projects which the EIC is now setting up could be, some, could be these super POC. So we are very glad about this cooperation. <laughs> Second, the EIC will have program managers. These are people that are experts in their field. And we have set up a pilot where EIC program managers and our scientific officers go through the projects in a particular area to search for gems. We will see how this works out and whether it can become more than a pilot. So I believe that the EIC and the ERC had a successful start for the collaboration. I look forward to our interaction in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Melhorn, for this very nice uh, perspective and uh, retrospective. So now I shall pass the floor to the lady of uh, our panel today, Professor Daria Mosley-Rosen. The floor is yours so that we can have also your views of what is happening on the other side of the Atlantic. Yeah, thank you. And uh, good afternoon to you. Uh, I don't know if you have my slides. Yes. So I'm the founder of Spark. And if you can have my slides, please. Yes, please. Can you so I will not see them. No. Just uh, this is a live event, so. Very good. Okay, I'll go without seeing them. I know my slides by heart. Okay. So I founded Spark. I founded Spark 14 years ago, uh, and the idea was to make sure that uh, academic innovation, such as the one that you've heard, will not go to waste; that they will end up uh, translating to benefit patients and society. That was the reason why this program was set up. I, we feel that it's our social responsibility to make sure that those inventions actually end up benefiting the patients since they were relying on payments from taxpayers. We also need to educate the educators, in other words, the professors, and the students and postdocs in what is done in industry. It's not intuitive and it's usually not taught in academia. And most importantly, we're also very keen on making sure that we are building a vibrant biotech environment around our academic institution. We started back 14 years ago, and it's now in over 60 institutes throughout uh, the world. And if you click, then, yeah, you see here in Europe, we are in quite a few countries, as shown in red, are countries with very active spark, and in some countries that are building up. Altogether, they are part of the 60 uh, country network um, ranging from Africa to Australia to the US to Brazil and so on. Next slide. So the formula is very simple. Um, we are relying on the, the advice of many advisors uh, from industry who volunteer their time. We do we on. On, on one site uh, on campus. And we make sure that the discussion are carried out without any hierarchy. Any idea should be floated. We don't try, next slide, we don't try to reach uh, a consensus. It's really important that unlike industry, can, we do I not try to reach uh, the consensus so that you don't reach the lowest uh, denominator, but rather keep the out-of-the-box thinking that academics are so good at. And finally, because we do it in one room, and here you see only half of the rooms that we meet in usually, now only on Zoom, unfortunately, we also learn from uh, failures, not only from success. And as you know, learning from failures is way superior. So next slide. We've been in operation for 14 years. Next slide. 
and our success rate, in other words, projects that move from academia to the hands of industry or to clinical trial is over 60%. That's way superior to what industry's success rate with about 120th of the funding, our success rate is probably six times better than industry. And importantly, when you start a company, the attrition uh, of startup is very high. Uh, according to a recent paper in Nature Biotechnology, it can reach as high as 90%. In our case, uh, the attrition rate over the 14 years is only 10%. And what I've shown here are the numbers in California, but the numbers are also quite similar in other countries. For example, in Taiwan, it's now around 40%. So this, this, is, this program is uh, working very well and make sure that our academic discovery is actually benefiting patients. We've been on, as I said, for quite a while. And next slide, we've also created a textbook and now working on education materials that we hope to share uh, with anyone in, in the world. So thank you for your attention. And I'm really excited to be part of this uh, exciting meeting uh, in Europe. Thank you very much, Professor Mosley, Rosen. And now I would like to pass the floor to Professor Tobias Kippenberg. Professor Kippenberg, the floor is yours. Hello. Thank you very much. Can you also pull up my slides? Yes, we are doing this right away. And uh, at your instructions, I shall be flipping the slides. Okay, so um, welcome. So my name is Tobias Kippenberg. I work at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. And I want to give you a animated kind of example of how uh, fundamental science that we have been privileged um, to have funded by the ERC with two advanced grants led actually to a new startup. And also I want to explain some of the challenges that we faced. So first of all, my research concerns optical microresonators. And here's a picture of a microresonator. And these are devices that confine light um, uh, in very small volumes on a chip. And so what you see here is a droidal resonator where light is circularly orbiting. And the light typically makes hundreds of meters of path lengths before it gets attenuated. So these are extraordinarily low losses that we can achieve on a chip. And this has allowed us to do some very early and groundbreaking experiments in a field called quantum optomechanics. And so if you go to the next slide, okay, uh, let me just mention that uh, there has been substantial advances um, in the last 30 years on manipulating atoms, ions, and molecules with laser light all the way at the quantum level. This has led to dramatic advances in timekeeping, atomic clocks, and even quantum computing. With our ERC research and also the optical microresonators, we extended the idea of laser manipulation in the quantum regime to macroscopic objects, to, to mechanical devices that are confined on a chip. And this was our fundamental research that we performed in the framework of, of two ERC grants. Now, by our serendipity, and this is shown on the next slide, we also observed that the same devices that allow us to manipulate okay, mechanical oscillators in the quantum regime also allow to generate so-called optical frequency costs. So working with Theodor Hench in, in, in the mid-2005, we discovered by serendipity that our optical microresonators can also produce what are called optical frequency combs. So what are frequency combs? Frequency combs can be thought of as a ruler for light. A ruler is composed of tick marks, and our tick marks are optical in nature. Our tick marks are many, many laser lines that are generated uh, typically by a specialized femtosecond laser that can be used to measure optical frequencies. Now, what are these frequency combs used for? They have allowed dramatic advances in timekeeping, spectroscopy, and today the world's most accurate atomic clocks use frequency combs to measure optical transitions. Now, these devices, however, have one challenge, and this is shown on the next slide. Already early research from the laboratory of Theodor Hensch commercialized frequency combs, and those are shown on the left. But these devices are typically based on individually assembled devices using fiber optic, lenses, and bulk components. And even today, 20 years after the invention of the frequency comb, there are only a handful of laboratories, typically about 100 in the world, that can operate these frequency combs in a laboratory setting. And why is that? Because most of our successful technologies that we use today Okay, be it cell phones, be it accelerometers in, in phones, 
are based on micro nanofabrication. So by the ability to scale the devices to very small dimensions at very low cost. As a side offspring project of our EC project, we recognized that we could miniaturize frequency combs on a chip by using optical microresonators. And this is shown on the left side, this is the right side. This is a technology called microcombs. And these miniaturize bulk fiber optic lasers all the way down to a chip. And um, this technology received quite some interest in the community. And four years ago, we decided to start a company called Ligentech, stands shorthand for Light Generation Technologies, um, that commercialized and gave access to this new technology. So our next slide, what you will see, okay, is our company and some key figures. Ligentech was founded in 2016. We took the very low last circuits we developed, commercialized them. Um, we are a business-to-business -business company, um, uh, a foundry. We, uh, we are still all founders owned. We are 12 FTE. We operate with more than 2 million franc uh, annual turnover. And we globally uh, distribute chips to customers uh, across the globe. Now, what actually allowed us to make that transition from an ERC project into a startup company that is now um, operating well and, uh, and, and is still in growth mode? And there were a number of challenges, but uh, chief among them, as shown in the next slide, is the ability to take a, a technology in the laboratory and to perfect it to a level that it can be commercially also uh, commercially viable. In my case, okay, uh, the blessing that we had was DARPA. I'm a performer from DARPA for 10 years. I've been under contract in seven different DARPA programs. And gladly, we had support and convinced our funders in Washington that um, we wanted to take the silicon nitride chips to a level that we can commercialize it. And um, um, in addition, we also had private foundation money in Switzerland. The second um, part uh, that was a challenge is seed money to start a company. And also here again, we were very fortunate to have money from DARPA that went into the company, okay, equity free, to help us start the, the, the company. So what were our challenges um, um, that we faced? Shown in the next slide. Um, the, 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 the funding situation we're in in Europe is that we have very good um, support on the ERC side um, and fed open for early stage research to generate new ideas. We have also very strong instruments such as SME instruments for helping establish company, but the area in the middle, that is vacant at the moment. The moment the POC um, um, gives a bit of support, but not sufficient to take a uh, technology really to the level where you can commercialize it. And at the same time, when a company is started, it takes funds to start it seed funds. And here, there's no equivalent to the SBIR that the US offers and that we could actually receive with our, with our research and our company. So in some, um, if you go to the last slide, um, um, what are the take-home messages? The take-home messages are the best people to commercialize are mostly the very scientists working on it. It's difficult to find and build a prototype in the laboratory. It takes an ERC to obtain the idea. It takes another ERC to really make it uh, um, a technology you can commercialize. And it's also very difficult to find seed money. And this seed money exists in the US in the form of SBIR and would be very desirable if Europe had similar instruments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive and informative presentation. And I shall now pass the floor to Mr. Filippo Bosco, CEO and founder of Blue Sense Diagnostics, a company that has received support from both the ERC and the EIC. Filippo, the floor is yours. Hello, Elsa. Thanks uh, also for the organizer to, uh, for inviting me this, uh, to this event. So, yes, I'm the CEO and co-founder of BlueSense. We are a Danish small and medium enterprise uh, located in Copenhagen. Uh, we focus mostly on providing um, innovative solutions for uh, the diagnostics of uh, infectious diseases, more specifically mosquito-borne diseases, such as dengue fever, Zika, yellow fever, and, and the likes. So recently, of course, we had uh, our role also in developing a COVID-19 test, but our core focus remains uh, tropical diseases. Uh, we are quite proud to do pretty much uh, 360 research, uh, development and manufacturing in health here in Europe, uh, and we mostly sell to um, dengue and any countries, or tropical disease in any countries such as Southeast Asia and Latin America. Uh, so the company uh, was a, is a spin out from uh, EU Nanotech, the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, we actually started uh, through a ERC, uh, POC grant. So I guess here um, my contribution is to be sort of a small uh, case study. 
uh, we come from a group of Professor Anya Boysen uh, from DTU Nanotech. She, she was a grantee of a large ERC project, and we could uh, uh, apply to our postdoc back in the days. We could apply to the ERC talk. Uh, we got it. It was very valuable, an extremely important asset for moving from sort of a laboratory uh, test into a full proof of concept. Uh, then we started the company, uh, we incorporated, we grew the company, and then we applied again for uh, EIC later on, which we got it in 2018, actually. So uh, both instruments are, uh, were extremely valuable. Uh, just the, the writing process of a complex and competitive brand, such as an SME phase two for EIC, is just worth the time. I mean, you're really forced uh, to think deep uh, in what is your business case, what are your strengths, uh, where are your weaknesses, uh, and the format in which you have to present your case really helps the founders uh, just to structure a better, a better business case. So, uh, I personally believe that further integration between these two units uh, would be of a very solid value for future companies that uh, uh, want to take it let's say, a similar, similar path as, as the one we did, especially, as it was mentioned already today, in sort of tackling some of the gaps that are in between. So in uh, ERC POC is, is, is a small, is a small grant, very valuable, but quite small. I, I heard uh, a nice word of like a potential super POC, which I would have loved to, to have applied back in the days, because the reality is that in these three to five years, uh, uh, which can be even longer for life science, like in our case, a gap in between you convert your research into proof of concept uh, all the way to when you are actually mature enough to apply and compete in such a competitive process such as an SME phase two application, uh, that can take easily three to five years in which it's difficult to find funding. In our case, of course, we had to uh, work on our own legs. Uh, the life science industry is quite capital intensive, so we had to rely mostly on private and investors that buy uh, equity investments. However, I'm sure that synergies between these two industries can sort of get closer together and then try to provide some tools uh, to ERC pocket grantees that would want to move into a full commercialization and company creation uh, to get uh, a facilitated access, if, if I can say so, uh, to an ERC to an EIC grant. It could be in the format of dedicated workshop, uh, in the format of uh, a uh, number of hours uh, of consultants that can be used for preparing a proper business case. It could be preferential access uh, to the pitching or scoring, if scoring above threshold. Uh, it could be dedicated sessions to uh, facilitate life science, well, specifically life science, uh, uh, the implementation of systems such as quality management systems, risk analysis, which is something in academia we are uh, quite, uh, uh, quite um, scared about. So. Yeah, I believe uh, that uh, companies that will do uh, will take this path in the future will surely benefit between uh, of synergies, uh, thanks to more synergies between the, the different organizations, and really closing this gap in between the ERC POC and the uh, EIC could be very very beneficial. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Filippo. I do not know, Jean David. Would you like to make a few uh, remarks at this point? No, I mean, the, I, I, I was I was looking also at the, uh, the questions, uh, and one question, in fact, was not a question. Uh, but I, I'd like to quote, in fact, what was written because it was, uh, I think, uh, a perfect summary of what we have just discussed. I mean, one of the auditors said, as an entrepreneur and innovator, I see that there is not two sides, ERC versus EIC, I see only one piece focusing on two pieces in the same whole EU innovation value chain. Uh, and to a certain extent, it is exactly what you have demonstrated in your various speech. Uh, I'd like to focus in particular, in order to be very pragmatic, uh, on the slides that were presented uh, by Tobias. Uh, when you have identified, in fact, the, uh, the holes or the gaps that you may have between uh, an ERC grant uh, and, and then uh, an EIC accelerator support. Uh, and this is exactly what we would like to address in, uh, in the joint working group between the um, EIC advisory board and the ERC scientific council in order to connect in a more fluid way 
what could come from an ERC grant or an ERC POC, and on the EIC side, what we are calling transition activities even before an EIC accelerator. Uh, because even at the end today of a, of a POC, I mean, a number of uh, excellent ideas that could be turned into the form of a startup are not necessarily mature enough to go to an EIC accelerator support. Uh, you need the transition in order to move towards the market, to take into account a number, a number of dimensions that you have not. You need this kind of voucher support that Filippo was mentioning at the end in order to, uh, to be able to uh, attract the, the right skills in your, in your future startup or in your spin-off uh, to, to better understand what is the market. So this is this kind of connection that we would like to create. Um, we have a tool for this. Lucky enough, we have in the legal basis of Horizon Europe the possibility of what we are calling a fast-track procedure. So connecting running project or ending project from other parts of the framework program to the EIC uh, and by providing some specific support in order to build the most relevant uh, proposal. So uh, this is where I think that we, we have to focus our work in the future because it's obvious that the two institutions have a lot in common that they can, they can bring a lot together but this must be turned into reality and nothing better than concrete acts. Uh, and this is, I think, what we should uh, try to achieve as a result, uh, as the output of the current work uh, of this joint working group. A very important point that was addressed by both um, uh, Mark and, um, and, uh, and Kurt uh, Mellon is, uh, is the key role that could play, in fact, the uh, program managers and the scientific officer on the side of the ERC in order to identify some gems in the running project. Uh, it's obvious that if we are able to do this and if we are able to work with portfolio of projects, we could have some very good gain for all the parties that are involved. Uh, it's another dimension that will be uh, implemented and that we are testing, as you know, in the context of the EIC. But it should be even more powerful, more impactful, if we are doing it also with our colleagues of the ERC. Because we have a number of projects on our side coming from the Pathfinder, but you have a lot that is coming also from your side and where we could have a pool of inno potential innovation that could be uh, identified. Thank you very much. I would like now to ask a question to Professor Mosley Rosen. This is something that we have um, slightly touched upon. And the question goes, what are the main reasons, perhaps by prioritizing, that cutting-edge science that has the potential to be developed to innovative drugs and or diagnostics, potentially benefiting the patients, almost never makes it out of the lab? So... Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this question. This is a, an element that was missing from the discussion so far, is the major gap in understanding what industry is expected from a project before they will take on a, this long-term investment that takes maybe 14 years and, or 15 years until it reaches uh, a product that is sold in the market, as opposed to a chip or a, or a diagnostic even. And, and the issue is really lack of knowledge. And so the structures that we provide is addressing this gap. We are mixing industry experts that are volunteering their time with our academician on campus. And together they exchange in real time, not only the, their own experience, but advice to the projects that are being developed. If you prepare the, the projects, if you mature the projects through the industry uh, or based on industry expertise while maintaining this out of the box academic uh, thinking you can really make the innovation practical but still keep it innovative i think those uh, elements are essential in translational research especially in drugs and diagnostics and you cannot figure it out on your own i was an entrepreneur three times and uh, in the the years that i've been doing it 
I've been learning more than I learned in academia, and I realize that also our students and postdocs are not prepared for this. <laughs> they are going to. So this education element is essential. And uh, you're using U U.S. as an example, so perhaps you can avoid the mistake in the U.S. regarding that. So money is one, and support of startup company is another, but preparing the entrepreneur to what the task ahead is extremely important. And part of it is coming through this immerse, immerse for in, in the content taught by industry experts. It's really essential. And the way you do it while keeping the confidentiality is making sure that the industry people are under confidentiality agreement and you do it on campus rather than within a company. So addressing the knowledge gap is a required essential element to make the entrepreneur a better partner for the industry and also for making the project more mature for uh, implementation. Yes. Thank you, Professor Mosley. You've uh, also touched upon the legal aspects, uh, intellectual property, the training that the inventors uh, need to receive the mentoring so that they can transgress to the role of entrepreneur. And I would like now to give the floor to Professor Ferguson uh, for his observations on this uh, aspect. Professor Ferguson. I think it's very important. It's very important uh, that, uh, particular, for example, in pharmaceutical drugs, that uh, folks understand the regulatory uh, constraints, uh, the ability to work to good laboratory practice or good clinical practice, and so on. So, educating entrepreneurs both about entrepreneurship but also about sector-specific uh, topics uh, is important. And we will work with the uh, EIT, the European Institute of Technology, on that. They have a number of programs. We will have our own uh, business acceleration uh, and mentoring services. And just picking up on an earlier conversation, you know, one of the things that the European Innovation Council wants to do um, is sort of to take those elements of DARPA and those elements of SBIR and put them in the European context and deliver them in Europe. So producing this transition funding that we talked about earlier, really important, and using the DARPA approach to have a portfolio of companies in a similar area, and then uh, adjusting uh, funding, increasing it where we see uh, really interesting leads. And that can be particularly important when those advances come from left field, from what is not really the current consensus. And they often come from disruptive research projects. They often come from people taking a contrarian view. So we really want to harness the kind of best elements out of DARPA, the best elements out of SBIR, put them into the various EIC programs and deliver them in Europe. And then focus on some real European values like addressing important societal problems around, for example, uh, climate action, around uh, responsible use of artificial intelligence, around digital agriculture, for example. Um, so I think those are important elements. But training the entrepreneur, and that sort of speaks to the session which we'll have later in the RI days where we'll be talking with the uh, EIT uh, and where they do uh, a lot of uh, uh, training of entrepreneurs and boot camping. So the EIC needs to be this kind of glue that needs to be reaching out to the ERC, to the EIT, to the EIF and so on, and making sure that all of those elements are delivered and delivered at scale. Thank you very much. Professor uh, Melhorn, a few observations on this aspect from your side. Yeah, I think we need to do a lot of education for our young people in with respect to entrepreneurship. Um, I think we still educate, at, I mean, when I talk to my young researchers, um, some still feel that entrepreneurship is dirty, doesn't have the same status as doing research. So I, 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 I founded a small company, which is now 30 people in the 90s, and uh, I'm a director at Max Planck. And that time, my, my sec the secretary general of the Max Planck Society told me, a Max Planck director doesn't do this. It's not as bad anymore, but still, this spirit that of division, that entrepreneurship and researchship doesn't go together, that one is inferior to the other, 
morally inferior, ethically inferior. This is something I think we have to work on, and we have to work on, on our kids in school on this. Because, uh, I mean, many of the, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I graduated from high school in 68. So I'm also deeply entrenched in this, uh, you know, so I went through student revolution and all these things. And um, so, I mean, in, in, in the back of my mind, when I founded the company, there was also this feeling of doing something wrong. <laughs> and, and, I mean, my generation, we are, the, we are teachers. I mean, my, my friends are teachers. And I, I'm sure we sort of uh, teach our students, maybe we don't say this anymore, but the spirit in what we say, and it, I, implicitly, I think we are still delivering this message. And this is something we have to work on. Okay, thank you very much. So here we are talking about um, the change uh, of mindsets, actually. And coming uh, to the young generation, we have four minutes left, and I would like to give the floor for a few words to Filippo and subsequently Tobias, and then uh, to Jean-David, potentially. So, Filippo, what's the vision of the younger generation? We surely need more training. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, I would assume, I tend to assume that when a scientist decides to uh, open a startup, uh, he, ha he or she uh, already has some sort of uh, entrepreneurial mindset. So let's be honest, if you have a PhD in quantum optomechanics, uh, making a five years projection business plan is not uh, something you cannot learn. Uh, I would also, uh, if, I, if I were in the, in the sort of a commission training plan, I would also think about investing more on the training toward industrialization. What, what are the challenges uh, in industrializing your product, uh, in having good manufacturing practices, uh, in having uh, what is needed, as was mentioned before, for arranging a licensing deal. So preparing not just, uh, uh, not just convince people to become entrepreneurs, because most of them are already convinced, but prepare them to the challenges ahead. Thank you very much. And Tobias, a couple of words before we close. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I could say a lot of work for 10 years with DARPA, but I must say one thing. Um, and I think that's maybe the one message that I would like to um, give to decision makers. ERC is based on individual excellence. It's based, the money goes to individuals, supports individual research groups. The problem right now that much of the European funding, what concerns innovation, is all with consortia. It doesn't make sense uh, to have a pathfinder where you have to apply with two, three other uh, companies. I think pathfinders, um, or, or there should be a funding instrument similar to SBIE, SBIR that, see, that funds researchers that transition out of the lab and funds just their project. One has to make that get, one has to make that step towards people, give them the chance, give them the money, and make them individually responsible instead of having large consortia. SBIR would truly be transformative if it was applied to EU funding. Okay. Thank you very much all. So we have heard about the past, the present and the future. And thanks to the EIC, we will be able to translate excellent science to world-beating technologies with all these inspiring and aspiring people that work in order to make this dream a reality. I would like to thank you all very much for your contribution. I would like to particularly thank Professor Mohli Rosen, which is, who got up very early today to join us from the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, thank you all for your kind contributions and wishing you the best of luck and many successes and a bright future for the EIC and the cooperation with the ERC. Thank you very much. Dear audience, thank you for your participation. Thank you to everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.